we're going to go ahead and get started with today's Speaking Truth panel. Welcome. I'm Mary Lee Brock. I'm the Assistant Director and Assistant Professor in the Department and Program of Negotiation and Conflict Resolution. And we're so happy that you took the time to come and join us in this important conversation. The Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program and the 2040 Initiative of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at Creighton University Graduate School sponsor the Speaking Truth series on current topics and issues related to social justice. The mission of Negotiation and Conflict Resolution is to prepare agents of social change to engage and resolve conflict effectively, efficiently, and humanely. The Speaking Truths panel provide a campus and community forum in which current issues involving equity and power are named and discussed. The purpose of the series is to create spaces for members of the Creighton and broader Omaha communities to speak our truths so that we may be understood and to listen so that we may understand each other. While Speaking Truths echo the familiar call for people to speak truth to power, it acknowledges that people may have many truths, and that while we must speak truth to power, we must also speak truth to each other. Today's Speaking Truth panel, Refugees, Housing Disparities, and the White Savior Complex, will explore housing disparities that have allowed the continuation and proliferation of subpar housing that disproportionately affects minority groups in Omaha. We will also evaluate the community's reaction to the situation at the Yale apartment complex and similar situations as a continuation of structural violence and manifestation of the white savior complex. So before we begin the panel, a couple of thank yous. And I already thanked you for taking your time and energy. An event like this doesn't happen by accident, so I'd love to thank staff that have sp spent a tremendous amount of time helping pull it together. Emily Bakovan. Monica Chapeau and Terry Mahaffey did a lot of the work to kind of make sure that this event can uh, go, go very smoothly and be something that we can really engage in. I'd also like to thank Palma Strand, the director of the 2040 Initiative, for her support of Speaking Truths, and a special thank you to Dr. Amanda Gadero for uh, conceiving the idea of this panel and making arrangements for it to all come together. So I'm going to turn it over now to Kristen Watt, who is one of our fine graduate students in the NCR program and about to be a happy graduate in May. So Kristen, I'll uh, turn the panel over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Watt. Um, I am a student in the Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program. Um, I'll be moderating the panel this afternoon, keeping us on time, so you can all get out of here by 1 p.m. Um, our hope is that we will have around 15 minutes for questions, but we want to make sure we have more than enough time to hear from all of our featured panelists today. Um, while this is going to be an hour of learning from many amazing experts in different fields, um, we also want this to be a call to action. So I encourage you all to kind of reflect on, on how you are feeling after, after hearing from each of these wonderful individuals and kind of take that out of this room. Um, and so I am actually going to let the panelists introduce themselves, kind of talk about their personal connection to these issues, and then they're going to speak on their knowledge on the subject. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. I'll keep us on time as best as I can. Um, and Precious, if you'd like to introduce yourself and get us going. One microphone. Okay, okay, I guess I'm kicking it off. I don't know, I would stand, but I get really nervous. So um, I'm gonna sit, guys. But uh, my name is Precious McKesson, and I am I'm currently the director of North Omaha Neighborhood Alliance. I also serve as the Urban Affairs Committee a clerk for, committee clerk for Senator Justin Wayne, and I'm also the Neighborhood um, USA National Board Member, which is actually called NUSA, and representing Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I will make mine a little short and sweet because I really want to really get questions and hear about what you guys really want to know instead of me talking about what I do. What do you? What concerns or what questions you have? Um, so my. My work in North Omaha Neighborhood Alliance started about maybe four years ago and I came into the um, neighborhoods basically as a um, liaison to the board to really assist with growing the neighborhoods and getting people more engaged. Um, since then I've taken a whole new role where I actually work with the neighborhoods supporting them. I don't consider myself over the neighborhoods, I just consider myself a support for the neighborhoods in the community. Um, 
I've always had a passion for North Omaha community because I grew up in North Omaha. I'm a product of North Omaha. And um, I feel that my work and the work that I do represents the community that looks like me and others. So it's not always just about communities of color, it's about everybody who lives in this community because normally, you know, we're starting to notice that North Omaha has a very diverse community. And normally, when as soon as you hear something bad about North Omaha, the first thing people think is African Americans. Well, that's far from the truth because we're very diverse. So um, my passion is the community. Um, after Yale Park um, took what happened back in September, um, I had started kind of thinking like, you know, like how do we prevent that? But then I realized that that's not the only community that's that lived that's been that way. There's many communities. We just this was just something that was brought to the forefront and um, kind of started looking at how we can prevent this more. So we, I know we'll go more in depth with that. Um, LB85 was a bill that a lot of people had asked me, like, why was it Nona at the forefront? Number one, Nona did not know, was not at the table when these things took place. And that was one thing that I still to this day feel that um, that's where a ball was dropped. North Omaha Neighborhood Alliance was, with when everybody else was in the news seeing it, we were seeing it too. And I feel that that was kind of like, it's in the middle of the community that we serve. We have a lot of people who work in the neighborhoods, but we were not notified. It was like, when you found out, we found out. Um, so with LB85, um, we, OTOC had reached out to us, had reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, we want to have a meeting with you to really talk to you about how do we, how do we go forward from this? And I was like, okay, so I met with them first and we, it was a really good conversation. I said, you know what? Let me go ahead and use this time to bring in my boss, who is Senator Justin Wayne. Now, if I bring him in and let him see what's going on, how can he make this effective? So at that point, we started meeting, and that's how LB85 came into existence um, with the help of OTOC. And I'm very grateful to the work that OTOC and Restoring, Restoring Dignity has done um, with helping us really um, address this and be able to give us the information because we can't do it on our own. It's a collective effort, and I was really appreciative of that. Um, information. So, um, you know, everybody knows how LB85 turned out. We held it for a while. Um, we did um, ha have um, discussions with the city and we were like, hey, how do we let them, let the city be able to come up with an ordinance that is sufficing. If, if it doesn't work, then we'll bring it back. And I feel that that was a fair, um, I honestly feel that was a fair trade to do. Um, and I told my boss, like, I, I felt it was a good thing to do. So, um, you know, we waited, we waited and now we now have an ordinance, so we'll just continue to see <laughs> where we go from here. Um, I feel that we can still hold many people accountable, and we have to continue the work um, to make sure that that ordinance um, is effective. And if it's not effective, then we come back to the table with something else. So with that, I'm going to pass this to the next person, and I'll be more than happy to answer more questions. I kind of didn't want to go into a, like I said, spill about what I do and why. I really want to know what you want to know, and then I can answer that question and be, um, to give that information back to you. Thank you, Precious. My name is Daisha Sudar, and I work on this campus um, at Creighton University, but I work for a grant-funded program called the Educational Opportunity Center. And what we do there is we serve the community, so we serve a thousand low-income and first-generation students with their educational goals. We do that in a variety of different ways. So we have English as a second language classes, GED classes, and we help with college enrollment services. So I am here just to give a little bit of insight for the education piece and the sort of human services aspect of what happened. Um, after a Yale Park occurred and many people got displaced, we saw an increase of phone calls about our classes because people were now trying to have to navigate new schooling situations and trying to find new resources for them. And so as a human services professional, just sort of thinking about how are we serving these people as they're going through additional trauma and getting them resources for continuing to be successful in their new move and their new housing situation. So while the housing issue was a huge deal, there's so much more that occurred than just these people losing where they were living and living in these sort of unnecessary environments that were just 
very harmful to their health and their way of life. So these people, our community was once again uprooted. They come from very traumatic past and now they're trying to have to deal with new routes to work, trying to get their kids back to school, um, things like that. And so they're, again, just dealing with more trauma. And so how are we addressing that in addition to addressing this housing situation that's occurring? Do we have anything in place for that? So those are some of the things that I continually think about regarding the situation. Um, because even though they're cosmetically in a better situation and they got relocated to new housing, are we now addressing the issues of do they have adequate education for them to know how to stand up for themselves in the future? Do they have adequate resources near where they're living now and things like that? Because housing is such a crucial part of our everyday lives. I mean, it determines where we work, where we get groceries, whether we have access to fresh produce, um, whether we have access to educational resources. And when people that speak limited English are uprooted from their community that they were once living in and trying to re-navigate these, how are we empowering them to ask these questions and to really stand up for themselves because this was, again, a traumatic situation. So if they were unable to deal with it in the first place and we advocated for them and we got this to occur and relocated them, how are we ensuring that they can now speak up for themselves if they're in that situation? I don't really know a lot about the housing that they're in now, but if they have a problem, do they know who to call? Is it their responsibility? If they get a fee increase, is that right? I have trouble navigating some of these things as a privileged white person, so I can't imagine dealing with this not knowing full native English. Um, so those are just some things that I think about on the human services side. Um, how are we on time? Good. Okay. okay. Um, and so I, after this occurred, I am in a lot of different groups in social media and things like that. And I saw a lot of people saying that they, you know, they had the option, like they could just move, like it was their responsibility to, you know, get things fixed and things like that. But Omaha really doesn't have a lot of options when it comes to affordable housing. So how are we addressing that? And how are we creating pathways to really, you know, create policies in place? for these vulnerable populations so that if there are situations like this, they're less afraid and more empowered to do something about it. So pass it down to Alma. So I'm gonna, uh, I have some slides. Um, so, <laughs> I'm laughing, precious. I always have slides. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna invite the panel to move around a little bit and So I'm Palma Strand, I'm a professor in the Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program and um, the director of the 2040 Initiative. And, and Amanda invited me to try to give a kind of a large scale overview of the situation of, of kind of the structure of housing and housing disparity. So I'm gonna focus on the refugees and housing disparities part um, rather than the white savior complex part. So I'm not kind of the overview. So, this is just a, a slide about where are refugees resettled in the U.S. And you can see that Nebraska actually um, is, has a high concentration of refugees compared, and that's you know, proportionate to our population. So this is a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue here in terms of just numbers. So how did I get into this? I get into this by asking the question, I'm not from Omaha, uh, you know, I came here 12 years ago, and um, I saw the patterns of the city in terms of where people live. And Omaha is a pretty segregated city, as many of you know. This is what's called the racial dot map. And you see that the green dots kind of in North Omaha represent African Americans. The yellow dots represent Latinos kind of in South Omaha. And the white dots represent, or the, green, the blue dots represent white people mostly in Western Omaha. And my question to myself as an academic who focuses on local government was why is Omaha still so segregated 50 years after the Fair Housing Act was passed? Um, and, and that sort of led me to um, enter into this question of sort of what housing and what the housing structures look like in Omaha. 
So focusing on refugees, this, this is a um, kind of a graph that shows you the basic income of adult refugees in this country. And as you can see, that, that refugees who have not been here very long do not have a lot of income, right? So this is a really economically challenged group of, of people and residents of our community. So if you're a refugee and you're coming to Omaha, you don't have a lot of money, you're going to say, like, where am I going to live? So you look at rental housing affordability. These are maps from the city of Omaha uh, from Ridley Further and Fair Housing um, work. You can see that the more, by and large, the more affordable housing is in eastern Omaha, often focused in the north. So, so refugees with not very much income are going to focus in, they're going to look for housing in north Omaha. This is also where publicly supported housing is focused in Omaha, right? It's predominantly east of 72nd Street and, and heavily focused in, uh, in the north. Not surprisingly, or coincidentally, this is also where housing code violations tend to occur. This is work that was done by Dennis Walsh of, of OTA. Why is this? Well, it's not just because housing is affordable in this area, it's because housing is older in this area. And most affordable housing in Omaha is old housing. That's how it comes to be affordable. This is also sort of correlates to where the money is in Omaha, right? So this is the low poverty index. And as you see, at the farther west, generally, the farther west you go in Omaha the lower the poverty is. And the farther east you go, the higher the poverty is. Those magenta rectangle shapes are the, what HUD calls the economic or racial, or the ethnic or racial concentrated areas of poverty. So how did this come to be? So there's, this is the redlining map of Omaha. For you, those of you who don't know the history of redlining, Redlining was a, was a program that was um, put in place by the federal government back in the New Deal, 1935. The federal government home ownership loan corporation sent people out to every city in the country over, with a population over 40,000. And they basically said, where are we going to invest in people to be able to buy homes? Right? And so they, they rated the city based on various uh, criteria, one of which was neighborhoods that were uh, predominantly African-American or integrated. And so what you see is there's three areas in Omaha that, are, that were redlined. Uh, the bottom one was around the stockyards. The middle one was around a brewery on South 24th Street. And the northernmost area was what was formerly called the Near North Side, which was where African-Americans lived. These maps were drawn by the federal government, but they were based on local practices that were already in place before the federal folks came to town. And what these maps did was they actually said, here's where the federal money is going to go. The federal money goes where that green area is, to the west of Omaha, suburbanization, which was at that point exclusively white, now predominantly white. And the eastern areas of the city were not going to get federal investment. So if you look at what, what the result of that is, is you see that area of disinvestment to the east of Omaha, and you see where uh, racial and ethnic minorities live in Omaha today, and there's an overlap. This is a map of uh, Omaha data, or Omaha residents by national origin. And, and once again, if you look at the tiny dots, you see that most of the folks in Omaha who come from other countries, and that includes refugees, but it also includes other kinds of immigrants, um, again, concentrated in eastern Omaha. And here's a map that was actually done by a, a student of mine for, for a different class. Um, that actually shows you where the concentration of refugee children is. We don't have a map of where refugees themselves live. So he actually um, used the data from OPS in terms of where refugee kids go to school to um, identify where the predominant of refugee families is. And what you see is that there's a ring of where refugee 
families are that's not concentrated in the most um, the most uh, poverty impacted areas in Omaha, but just kind of in a ring around that. Okay, so high poverty areas, but not the highest poverty areas. So um, this kind of gets to something that Desha said. This is um, the, the question of, um, so we know that refugee families coming <coughs> into Omaha are gonna be focusing on those affordable areas in Eastern Omaha and particularly Northern Omaha. But the problem is that there isn't enough housing. So this is, this is from the Fair Housing and Equity Assessment that was done uh, by the Heartland 2050 effort in 2015. For every 100 residents that qualify for housing assistance, only 23 units are available. Okay? And, and Omaha is actually not unusual in this. Omaha is not a particularly bad city in this regard. This is a nationwide issue. But this means that people who don't have a lot of resources are really don't have a lot of options. And in fact, over the last 10 years, this has gotten worse for the most low, like the lowest income <coughs> residents. The housing available for the lowest income residents has actually declined. So there's a real shortage. So stepping back and looking at kind of the structural part of this, we see that at the federal level, high income households actually get four times more housing, more housing benefits than low income households. So if you look at all the federal money that goes to support housing in this country, four times as much of that money goes to high income, mostly homeowners, mostly through the mortgage interest deduction, versus all the assistance for rental housing for low income. So there's been a real sh investment in upper income home ownership and a disinvestment in low income rental housing. At the local level, this is an area that I did some re research on a couple of years ago, there's really been mechanisms that have um, a enabled development, upscale market development to the west, predominantly through the sanitary improvement district mechanism in ways that have kind of squelched any kind of conversation in the city about inclusionary zoning, but also about exclusionary zoning. So housing is built to the west in SIDs, in, in market rate housing that has no affordable housing and it's not, not mixed income. So this is a, just a snapshot of the Nebraska state law that has to do with you know, kind of what housing is supposed to look like, right? You know, these are the basic requirements. Keep all areas clean and safe, good working order, electrical, plumbing, etc. These are the kind of standard, some, in law it's called a warranty of habitability. It's like any place that is rented out should be habitable for, uh, for, for human beings. This is a kind of a, this is actually not applied to Omaha, but this is typical of um, how complicated it is for a tenant who uh, knows that, there are, that repairs are needed to figure out whether they should withhold rent, whether they should call, whether they should, you know, what. It's, a, it's an extremely complicated legal process. And refugees often, as Deisha pointed out, don't have a lot of sophistication. Uh, they're afraid to raise issues for other reasons. They're afraid to get evicted because of this housing shortage and because they don't have a lot of resources. The bottom line is that safe, affordable housing is often out of reach for refugees and, as Precious mentioned, for other people as well. It's not just an issue for refugees, but it does definitely affect, uh, it does definitely affect refugees. And that's my contribution. Thank you, Palma. Let me turn it off. Yeah. Actually, if you go to the code violation map, um, oh, you want me to tell? I do, and I do talk about that a little, and the We Don't Slum website, which I think some folks in this room uh, were behind. So, um, otherwise, you keep that, that map in your mind. So, I'm Amanda Gadero. As Mary Lee pointed out, I convened this panel. Um, I've been thinking about something that uh, connects sort of the global and the local for over a year now, and I was asked to put together some sort of panel, and then Yale happened. 
and it made that link uh, quite easy for me. And so I'm grateful for all of you being here and I'm so happy with the, the um, input and the folks that are at this table with me. I come at this from a, a very different way. I actually come at it from an international way. So um, my work is on international issues and in particular uh, how we intervene to help humanitarian crises and in uh, areas of underdevelopment. And in that work, uh, questions always emerge um, about accountability, how money gets to intended recipients, is it actually doing uh, what it's supposed to do, what are the ramifications in the long term with these kinds of interventions. And one case that's particularly obvious is Haiti. So the U.S. government uh, gave food aid to Haiti in the form of rice that was maybe helpful in meeting the needs of the community at the time, but in the long term, it has uh, had crippling effect on the farming industry. It's harmed the economy and it's put farmers out of business. So some of our best intentioned efforts uh, in the short term have created long-term consequences. I'm not from Omaha. I wasn't involved in any of the Yale um, uh, decisions, so I'm, I won't get into that, but rather this, this whole thing just sparked some questions in me that are similar to the questions I ask um, when we think about intervening in other places uh, across the globe, but also in our communities. So I'm going to talk about the white savior complex now. The notion of the white savior complex is useful, and it really emerged from scholars like myself studying foreign intervention into uh, places that are under duress. And basically, it looks at the motivations, actions, and effects of white populations from what international relations scholars term the global north, um, and how, how uh, these populations intervene on what's termed the global south. Um, and historically, we've called this sort of um, intervening and saving Africans or civilizing barbarians. So that's kind of the history of where this uh, first starts to become visible. And then sociologists and others studying culture and media have really tapped into this framework to explore the phenomenon that we see increasingly in film of a white person entering into a stereotyped non-white community and doing some sort of intervention that saves them. So these are the, the <coughs> awe-inspiring and uplifting coaches, teachers, more recently the drivers. And so <laughs> we, uh, this, this is a useful framework and we can take issue with maybe what it's, it's how it's termed, but it's really helpful in us <coughs> understanding the way we study and understand interventions in all sorts of different ways. Um, so more recently in 2012, Teju Cole, a self-identified Nigerian-American, termed the coin white savior industrial complex in a series of tweets. And what he says is, many of us see and feel a need to address the immediacy that exists in situations, but we might also look at the complicated root causes and patterns that give, give rise to unequal development and disasters. And I think none of us, it, those of us who even loosely looked at the Yale situation can say it was a disaster for the people living there. Um, he reminds us that making a difference in the lives of those affected by such events is not sufficient. It's not a reason to get involved, nor does it guide us to the right methods of intervention. And he pushes us to consider our own actions in the larger context of cultural and structural violence. In Omaha, and Yale in particular, this framework leads me to ask a number of questions. And certainly there are answers to these questions that I don't know, but I'm just putting them out there. Um, and these questions pertain to two different actors, so I'm going to focus first on the landlords, and then generally on the public. So, the landlords. Uh, the White Savior Complex pushes me to ask how certain landlords in the city have been able to continue operations and uh, develop areas that end up in the situation like Yale, and as uh, Precious and Deja alluded to other as well. Uh, how do these landlords frame what they do in such a way that, again, they're allowed to continue, but in some, some landlords are actually able to open new uh, complexes and receive uh, local, state, and federal support in so doing. And I think we got some of the logic of this framing in some of the news articles that emerged post-Yale, not just by Kay Anderson, but others, and some names probably emergently uh, uh, popped to mind. But these well-off, self-described do-gooders often contend that they're not making a profit. This isn't a profit industry for them. This is all about providing, uh, filling a, a much-needed uh, space for affordable rental housing in the city. Um, they're helping people. They're giving back to God and community by sheltering people in need. Right, so that is pretty typical framing of the white savior complex. And. Um, 
it necessarily depicts them in a particular role, right, as the helpers and the saviors. And maybe taking individually, we might even appreciate some sort of good intention behind these uh, efforts. We consider that these landlords predominantly offer housing in particular areas in the city that correspond with race, lower socioeconomic class, food and hospital deserts, redlining, toxic pollution, and so on, we begin to see a pattern. And I think my colleagues have driven home some of, the, some of these pieces. Um, furthermore, the types of housing and the same set of conditions that, in the, uh, that, that kind of create housing in particular places also give rise to a very particular kind of uh, landlord who emerges as both a savior and a slumlord in this story. This pattern is especially evident in the We Don't Slum website uh, and that we actually saw a picture of the critical code violations uh, throughout the city that follow a particular pattern. And I know some of you in the room, again, were behind the We Don't Slum web website. It does show this pattern quite clearly. So the other way this plays out is in the public response to these events. We are so quick to offer them much needed material support without realizing the complexity of the situation. And this is a we very broad. Um, so our assistance might not meet the needs of the population or like the example in Haiti, meet the short term needs but have long term detrimental consequences. Cole again pushes us to reflect on how and more importantly why we intervene and to consider if our intervention is undermined by decisions that we make in other areas of our life. They may seem innocuous, but they might play a role in perpetuating the very systems that gave rise to Yale in the first place. We might interrogate why some people, uh, or why some situations draw more attention than others. Again, looking at the map, certainly there are many potential Yales in our community. So why Yale? Why was there so much media attention to Yale? Is it the scope and the scale of the situation? Is it the, the demographics? Uh, the population that was affected is something else. And this isn't to dismiss the very real problems that uh, emerged in that, but rather to say that when we focus on one group to the exclusion of everyone else, we're silencing affected voices. We have to be really careful about that. Does this mean that donations and other forms of assistance uh, to support people caught up in these kinds of disasters are inherently bad? I don't think so. Um, but I do think it means that we need to do more work to advocate for changes in the system to prevent these things from happening in the first place. We need to recognize the origin story of the issues that create circumstances like Yale and others. We need to advocate for a new narrative that does not play into stereotypes about neighborhoods in our communities. And if you're at the table where decisions big or small are being made about your community, look and see who is there, but more importantly, who isn't who's not at the table, and use your voice to bring attention and create space for, for folks who aren't represented. It also means asking more questions, learning the needs of the community that's most affected, affected and recognizing their agency in decision making. So I'm gonna wrap up with, with a quote from Cole, and I realize, um, I realize how it sounds, but it just really struck me. Cole says, white, the white savior supports brutal policies in the morning, founds charities in the afternoon, and receives awards in the evening. In the context of where we're sitting here uh, at Creighton University and the Ignatian charism of men and women for and with others and the call for social justice taken on by many progressive individuals and institutions, I cannot help but wonder what does it mean to be for and with others? How can we leverage our actions in small and large ways to ensure we move beyond the role of the savior and into a genuine space of partnership in the pursuit of justice? In conversations about plastic bag bans, garbage cans, neighborhood associate, association meetups, pothole cleanups. Whose needs are prioritized? What areas are the focus of attention? Who is in the room and who's left behind? I'm certain that so many people in this room who I recognize and know and some who I don't uh, are acutely aware of all of these dynamics or, and are doing work uh, to address them. And, but some of you might not have heard of this framing or thought much more deeply beyond giving your uh, donations when and where you can. So I hope this pushes you to, to think about that a little further. And with that, um, I thank everybody on the panel and I'll turn it over to Kristen and we'll have time for Q&A. Quick round of applause for our panel. Um, yeah, so I think we're gonna have plenty of time to hear from the audience. I just have one question for you all. Um, personally, I want to connect this to Creighton being a student at the university and someone that works here as well. Um, Amanda touched on at the end 
We pride ourselves as an institution on being men and women for and with others. Um, how can Creighton start to improve our relationship with our neighbors? Um, we're a part of this community, these are our neighbors, and we need to be better with each other in this um, fight for justice. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but first I want to say why I chuckle when, when Palma got up to do her slideshow, because every time when she does a slideshow, it's like I literally open up my brain and I just let everything go into it, and then I close and I'm like, okay, I need to go back and research that, because she always makes me think and say, you know, you need to go further, go deeper into what you're researching, so I enjoy it every time when you get up there and you bring out a slideshow. <laughs> I know I'm have a learning, a teaching, you're teaching me at that time. Um, to get Creighton more involved, now I do know there has been some initiatives um, with Creighton being more involved in the community. I know that a lot of students do go down to the global, leader, global leadership um, area off of 24th and I think it's Wharton Spencer area to do neighborhood cleanups. Um, I think you're, you're going in the right direction. I just feel that they just need to continue a little bit more and be a little bit more visible because I mean, I was just talking, I think I was talking to Amanda about this the other day. It's just crazy how with me having a high school student who's a freshman in high school, Creighton isn't even on our radar, she's an honor student. And we live right here in Omaha. And it's because she's never been pushed to say, oh, Creighton is a good school to go to. You will get a great education because she doesn't, it's not been a welcoming to, to me as her mom. I haven't been said, oh, well, you know, you can go to Creighton. There's people that look like, I, I never had that, that um, wanted to push her to do that, but it's been more of UNL, UNO, or actually out of state. Do you want to go to a college? Like I've been like, hey, look, you go to school in Mississippi. Now that's kind of weird to say you want to send to a, class, a school that has, I mean, a, a state that's more segregated than Nebraska, but I feel she'll make, she might fit in a little bit more rather than just go 10 minutes down the interstate to come right here to Creighton. So I feel they need to do more and partner more how UNL and UNO is partnering the schools. I know they have Upward Bound, I know they have different programs, but just push a little bit more so we can really get our students really like engaged and hey, let's keep them here in the state rather than go out of state and then once they go out of state, once they explore, they don't sometimes they don't come back. You know, they're like, hey, we're you know, there's opportunities here. So I would say in that area I think, you know, it's going in the right direction, just a little bit more work to it. I'll add a sort of call to action for that. Um, I, as I mentioned, we do serve a thousand community members every year at our center right down the street, um, and they are, you know, self-disclosed low-income adults in this community. And I would love to implement a sort of series where we have faculty or students come in and talk about these housing issues and give education on the subject because it is so complex. Um, we have classes every week, so if someone wants to come in and do that, feel free. Um, hmm. So I guess that I think that the work that I've done on, on housing and the, the history of redlining and, and kind of how the institutional structures of Omaha today continue to perpetuate this injustice, to me that's an area where we, as a, I as an academic, have have something that I can be in conversation with the community that that adds to that conversation that I see happening in the community. And, and to me that's part of being for and with the community <coughs> is, is being part of that conversation but bringing that voice that I have. I'll only add that the white savior complex tells us to uh, spend more time focusing on needs rather than what we think people need actually asking them what they need and asking them what they want. And I am not all over this community and I'm not all over Creighton, so I, I'm sure that's happening in some places, um, but I think we can always do a better job of talking to people and asking them what they need and what they want from us rather than uh, going in with the assumption of what people need and want. Thank you. So a lot to unpack here and a lot in the room. Um, I'm wondering if I can maybe get a, a mic runner so we can hear everyone. Oh, thank you, Monica. <laughs> Um, so I'd love to take some questions from the audience now. Um, I'll just kind of do my best to point. Okay. This works. 
So your question about why we focus so much on Yale Park is intriguing because as housing advocates, it's a problem that we run into all the time. Because we know, and everybody who works in this field knows, that Yale Park is not an, anomal it, not an anomaly. I can talk today. Um, we know that it's just one on a sort of spectrum of egregious, right? Um, so our problem, or how I might answer that, is that the Yale Park situation seemed very easy to articulate as not the responsibility of the tenants. Right, that this was outside of their control. And I think part of that has to do with our perception as the public and our, um, our ability to slide into the white savior complex. But I'm wondering uh, your, your, all of your thoughts on how we can be better messengers of the, the ubiquity of this problem, of this housing problem, without saying, like, without being a white savior, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to say, so we always, we, we focused on Yale Park, and, and this is my thing I kind of go back to. Before there was Yale Park, that apartment complex was called Tommy Rose. So I, last night I was sitting on the internet, I said, let me find information on Tommy Rose apartments. Because it was, it was, it was all African American, it was majority low income, it was horrible. You know, they, they had, I felt like when I started looking at the background, they were living in the same conditions before this. So I still go back to how did they move, they relocated all those families into scatterside housing, into Section 8 or any type of um, low income vouchers. How did that property become come back? How? Because I thought at one time, and I hate to put you on the spot, Mr. Franklin Thompson, but I thought that at one time that was going to be closed when they did relocate. And then so I, so I kind of questioned like when we started to see um, the refugee communities coming over and, and we started saying, well, how did they open this back up? Like, who decided? And I'll be honest with you, there was people, there was, before this happened, years before this <laughs> happened, we would drive past and say, how is this going on over here and no one is saying anything? I mean, I remember driving past and a lady was outside cooking, but then, and I said, okay, well, this is, this is what her normal habits are with the open fire. This is what they're, no, this, what they're accustomed to. And it's like, but why? And then I started, and then I remember having a, a phone call with someone from Lutheran Family Services, and they had advised me that when they come over, that they only get like a certain stipend, and they have so many days to find uh, before they can find resources, 90 days or something. And I'm like, really? Like, we have people that, th that live in this city and can't even find a job in 90 days or find resources. How do you expect someone who, who does not know our, our language or anything? And, and to your question, Aaron. Um, yeah, I felt like when we did this, I always kept thinking like when those kids went to school, did anybody think of the kids that went to school that morning? We kept focusing on Yale Park and the conditions, but did we think about the kids? Did we think about the children who went to Franklin Elementary who are 99% free and reduced lunch that when they go to school, they were coming home to nothing? Did we think about that? And I commend OPS and their staff because I saw those buses pulling up to that church parking lot and those kids getting off and being able to, like, where's my mom? Then having to be transported to Adams Community Center, then being fed, you know, pizza. I mean, I, I just kind of felt like, did we think about that? Did we, did we really go full? And that's why I felt like that's why it should have been more people at the table. More people of color, more people who work in this community at that table because I felt when I asked that question, it was like, oh, well, this was just something that we just talked about in, um, you know, we didn't think to bring the neighborhoods in. Oh, really? But then you want me to come to the press conference? Oh, really? No, I'm going to stand right here by this tree and listen, and then I'm going to go and talk and see what I just feel like at that time, it, it needs to be more to, to prevent that white savior mentality. It needs to be like, hey, we need to be more transparent. It needs to be more people at the table, not just your, your big nonprofits. The it needs to be the little people, because normally the people who are out here doing the work are the people who don't get paid too much, who don't get paid at all, who are really doing the work. And then you have the big nonprofits who are getting all the glory and everything else. No, we need to start looking at the people who are actually really doing the work and really in the trenches before we start saying, let's go to bring everybody. That's my take on it. Sorry. I, 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 no, I can't. I, there's nothing I can add to us. Should I respond first? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, yeah. Precious, for uh, bringing up that very legitimate question. Um, the best that I can tell, um, it was not my uh, council district, but I did have some knowledge 
of the old uh, Tommy Rose uh, apartment buildings, and it was horrible. Uh, Mr. Anderson bought that property from HUD only for $500,000. Wow. And which means that there is a, a chance uh, someone was saying how that they're not making money on these things. There's an opportunity that he was making about $1.5 million a year profit off of that. But um, apparently what happened was in order for him to get that property, the city needed to sign off that they were being repaired correctly. And between that sale and um, it being properly signed off or something was missing, something got dropped really bad. And so right now, um, normally my office would be um, the one that's uh, investigating on behalf of the citizens. And when the gentleman made his comment about that these people are used to being living in the jungle and all that, I just smiled real big and said, you made my case easy. <laughs> but um, I got a call from uh, Kansas City, which is our regional office, and they said, let us do the uh, cases. And the reason why is because not only are they looking at Mr. Anderson, they're actually looking at our, our planning department too. So because the city cannot investigate itself, uh, right now HUD is investigating that. But somewhere along the line, there was a ball that got dropped. And uh, maybe I'm not being a, a great member, a team member by saying that publicly, but the truth is the truth. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that was systemic or just one or two people, but there should have been some balance and checks before they were rented to the Korean population. Somehow they got dropped. So that's part of what the investigation is right now, as we see. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Emily, and I work with Lutheran Family Services over the Refugee Resettlement Department. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions related to the 90-day benefits that refugees get when they first come to the country. Um, my question specifically is for you, Precious. Um, as we heard the panelists discuss kind of the importance of refugee voice or um, participant voice, can you speak to, as LB85 is being developed, how refugee voice was solicited and represented in the language of the bill? Okay, so in LB85, um, we, how do we, I'm trying to see how we, I'm not, I'll just give this disclaimer, I'm the committee clerk, I am not legal counsel. <laughs> so when LB85, when it came to the refugee voice, we, um, Hannah had reached out to us from Restoring Dignity, and actually on the day that it was a, a major blizzard we were having, they traveled to Lincoln and testified. So we heard, we were in hearings, I think we had, I don't know, um, Aaron, how long was the hearing? Three and a half hours. Three and a half hours on a Tuesday, it was a blizzard outside, they were there to testify. And I heard stories, and I think that was how Senator Wayne was able to go in and make a few amendments because the stories he was hearing um, they were all basically the same. So when we when he did LB85, it was more of he had included all, he wanted all municipalities in the whole entire state. But then they came and said, no, we don't want that. So he said, well, we'll just focus on Omaha. So to answer that question, I think it was more of not just focused on just Yale. It was all over. We received calls from people on 178th and Dodge to tell us about slumlords. And they were sending pictures. I mean, I've never seen so many pictures come through on an email. I was like, this is just like, how is this happening? Like, you know, I mean, I just didn't, I just have never seen that people are not, can let people live like this. And so I think that was one thing. And then it was kind of hard to say, how do we get people who weren't refugees, you know, because I think that was the more people people who um, were living in those conditions, some didn't want to talk, you know, they were like, well, you know, we ain't gonna be able to find anywhere to live, you know, we just, we don't want to be, but the refugee community was more open, even when they took a tour of the apartments over off of Northwest Radio Highway, a few senators went to that um, on a weekday, they were more open for us to see that, and um, 
I think people kind of took it a little, I mean, if you notice, you didn't see, you only seen one landlord that I, that, that's a, you know, not going to give him his shine, but that was only one landlord that really came in opposition. But I will say this, the crazy thing about that is that his son signed in as neutral. I'm like, really? You signed in here, but you signed in as neutral. You didn't, you didn't say you were against this, but you signed in neutral. So I said, well, maybe he has a little heart. He really understands what we're trying to do. So in regards to, ref, I don't think it was totally just for the refugee. It was more, that's what sparked it. But it was more of like, we know there's more communities out here. And we still know that there's more communities out here that can be a Yale Park. Um, it just ha so happened that Yale Park happened first. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Creighton. This is my second time. I'm a refugee, so I can speak boldly about refugees. <laughs> I appreciate it. I moved from St. Louis, Missouri. This is my second time by Jesuit, such a advocacy. And my dad was trained by Jesuit, but I'm Lutheran youth pastor, chaplain. Uh, I was in St. Louis. Uh, the issue of discrimination, mostly people see by color, but it's uh, sometimes by country of origin. Uh, Lacey Clay was a governor, a good guy over there. We complained with a Bosnian white imam. I'm a Muslim. Because every time we go to services, they request us, bring interpreter. I got masters. My friends got GED. What's the benefit of learning here? And then, oh, oh, Lacey Clay told us, I will discuss, no problem. Immigration, my supervisor is white Texan. He went there, and the lady told the Cuban guy, what you speak, bring interpreter. My supervisor, the white Texan student, excuse me, ma, he can speak plain English. See? So next time, please invite immigrant, refugee, or alien, or new American like me to speak first-hand information. So also check commission. In St. Louis, there is a good experience. They call, uh, can I have one bedroom for me? And the other guy, one American. Can I have one bedroom? So they deny the one with the accent of mine. So the person the same request with different accents. Mm. So that's still for you. So I appreciate Creighton. Long live, keep up on advocacy for me, earlier refugees. refugees and other minorities, um, I 100% agree with we need to ask and not assume. And I think that's a, a big problem with, uh, with nonprofits and other uh, neighborhood groups. So what I, is your opinion on um, how we can best help a really hard question um, but I think there is a big need in the community to be more than just an ally but to be a mentor and to really try to engage with people and just talk to people and talk to your neighbors and talk to people in these communities as they are you know we are men and women with them so just being a good mentor and if you have knowledge share that knowledge and don't be afraid to share it um, and active listening so just process what people say. And I'll just add that, just like what the gentleman just said, um, don't assume. Just because they live in a low income area, don't assume that they're, they're impoverished. Don't assume that they might choose to live there. There's a lot of people that just decide to don't want to want to stay in their own community. It's like, like she said, ask. Find out what the need is instead of saying, this is what I feel you need. Because sometimes, you know, when you start, when you assume, kind of comes back to bite you. I mean, and you can get involved in different ways. Um, it's just, I guess you just have to go into the, it's, it's so hard because you don't want to, because some, it, it, it's like you, it's like a double-edged sword. You might be involved and say, oh, well, here she is still with this white savior mentality. And technically you're not because they're not, they're just still fixated that you're there to help. So they may not know. So I just say it's going to take time 
um, but just continue to just you know be there and help, but just be, like I said, be a support system. Um, there was one thing that I will say with um, Restore Dignity when um, when we were doing the um, the donations and we got this email and it said, and I, and I take pride in this, it, it always says when you go into their home, you are a guest in their home. But we were teaching them how to to uh, adapt to our store. So instead of just saying, hey, here's some donations, go in and show them how to put the dishes away, how to load a dishwasher. Just don't give it to them and think that, give it to someone, think that they're gonna expect how to use it. Show them and then it can become a habit to them. And that was one thing that I did learn instead of me taking a donation now, I actually wanted to show you how to use my donation, not me just giving it to you and then walking away as if I don't care. So I think that in the short term, I think that obviously um, kind of asking people what they need as opposed to making assumptions. But I also think that, that there's the question of sort of the longer term, you know, the, kind of the longer term what's happening here. And all of this, or a lot of this is happening because we don't have enough housing for people that they can afford in this community. And like I said, this is not just Omaha, this is around the country. We don't have enough housing for people who don't make a lot of money. So what can we do about that problem that is going to make the, that's going to change the supply and demand? I mean, a lot of the reason that people put up with these kinds of living conditions is because they feel like they don't have options. So how can we create options? And I think that that's a question for uh, developers in this country, you know, in the city, developers, like where, where, where is that? below market rate or affordable, whatever we call it, where is that housing? And, and it's a question for the city. So where are the requirements, where is this in the city's plan? Like how, how can we make sure that new developments have affordable housing in it? It's a question for the state, because the state is the one that sets the requirements for um, who, can, you know, who can build and under what conditions. And it's a question for the federal government. So I think that those longer term questions Kind of keep pushing on those is really important as well as dealing with the short term. And kind of piggybacking off of that, part of my thinking about when I came up with this panel was that this is not uh, this is not the cause of something like the situation in Yale isn't just a standalone isolated event. It's it's a consequence of a series of overt and implicit decisions and biases that affects not just Omaha but everywhere. I'm from, I'm, from, I'm from Portland, Oregon. We have our, our share of these kinds of dynamics as well. Um, and so as an individual, what do we do? And part of it's like showing up in solidarity and in support when invited and where appropriate. Uh, seeking out voices that are different. So maybe you're, you're not familiar with che Teju Cole, but you should be because he offers a different perspective. Um, I follow Ruby Sale on Instagram, uh, on Facebook because she tells me a story I don't regularly hear. And just being aware and constantly sitting with with yourself and kind of questioning where am I situated in this, right? Am I trying? And, and I, it's a question I ask myself. And it's a it's something that as we get into conversations around white privilege and white humility, it's really useful to sit with with these questions of as as a person in my position. I just I moved um, uh, south of here, and I maybe I'll go to the homeowner uh, the neighborhood association, and I'm going to ask myself, are my neighbors who are incredibly diverse who live east of 32nd here, do they know about this? Were they invited to this as renters? If not, maybe I'm gonna start asking some questions about that, right, to the people who will listen to me by virtue of the privilege that I have. So I think there's a lot of systems pieces that Palma identified, and there are a lot of other pieces as individuals that we can do. Okay, hopefully this is a good question because I guess it's the last question. We'll see. Um, yeah, uh, and it's uh, it's like kind of tr true that uh, those that are closest to the problem are the best suited to solve and find solutions. How would we know, or what would it look like if um, instead of asking how can we help, um, what would it look like in our community if those individuals and communities were in decision making power to come up with their own solutions? Like how would we know that's occurring? We wouldn't. 
Yeah, someone has to. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Vicky Nachibo Kamoli, and I'm an immigrant who has lived in Omaha for almost 20 years. The reality is, everybody does this. We walk into our community and we tell them what we'll give them and what they need. You need to ask the community, what do you need? So the white savior complex of, we did this for them, we did this for that, that does not work. In any social programming, public health programming, it does not work. But bringing people to the table, you don't look any harder than what you have around you. We are in the community, very many of us, who are willing to help, but nobody gives us the mind to speak up. So until you step outside of who you know, you will not get any further in the communities. Look for us, we're here. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. So that, is, that takes us at the top. Um, so that concludes our panel for the day. Um, I think Dr. Gadero is going to stick around a little bit if you have further questions. I'm not sure about the other panelists. But thank you all so much for being here. Um, and thank you so much to Monica for running our mic. <laughs> thank you again.